Let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our panel discussion on amending state and federal constitutions to prohibit sex discrimination. Uh, I am Jerry Smith, a judge on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and I am privileged to be able to uh, to moderate what I what, what I, I promise you will be a, an outstanding panel and a and a superb uh, discussion of this uh, uh, of this topic. Uh, let me uh, first introduce to you and and give you. Uh, uh, the resumes of our of our three uh, of our three panelists uh, in the order in which uh, they'll speak. Uh, first is uh, Professor uh, Martha Davis. Uh, professor Davis is a professor at Northwestern University School of Law and co-director of the law school's program on human rights and the global economy. Before joining uh, the Northeastern faculty. Professor Davis was the Vice President and Legal Director of the now Legal Defense and Education Fund in New York. Uh, in that capacity, she litigated cases at all levels of state and federal courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court, where she argued Nguyen versus INS. Uh, she has frequently litigated cases involving state ERAs, including the ERAs of Massachusetts, Alaska, New Mexico, Connecticut, and Maryland. In addition to her numerous articles on women's rights, human rights, and social welfare, She's the co-editor of the forthcoming uh, Bringing Human Rights Home, a three-volume set on the human rights movement in the United States, and author of the prize-winning book entitled Brutal Need, Lawyers, and the Welfare Rights Movement. Professor Davis has a BA from Harvard, an MA from Oxford, and a JD from the University of Chicago. Next is Phyllis Schlafly. Uh, Mrs. Schlafly received her JD from Washington University Law School. She's a Phi Beta Kappa and Pi Sigma Alpha graduate of Washington University, received her master's in government uh, from Harvard. She served as a member of the Commission on the Bicentennial, Bicentennial of the U.S. Constitution from 1985 to 1991. She served four years on the Administra Administrative Conference of the United States and ten years on the Illinois Committee on the Status of Women. Mrs. Schlafly's national career began in 1964 with her best-selling book, A Choice, Not an Echo. In 1972, she founded the Eagle Forum, a national organization of citizens who participate in the public policymaking process as volunteers. She was the leader of the 10-year battle that culminated in the defeat in 1982 of the proposed Equal Rights Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Ms. Schlafly is a prolific writer, and her most recent book is one I guess I need to read. It's called The Supremacist, The Tyranny of Judges, and How to Stop It. <laughs> She's the author or editor of 20 books on subjects as varied as family and feminism, uh, The Power of the Positive Woman in Feminist Fantasies, a book on nuclear strategy called Strike from Space and Kissinger on the Couch, uh, Education, titled uh, Child Abuse in the Classroom, uh, Child Care, entitled Who Will Rock the Cradle, and Reading, entitled First Reader and Turbo Reader. Mrs. Schlafly has written her newsletter called the Phyllis Schlafly Report monthly for 40 years. Her syndicated newspaper column, which she has written since 1977, appears in 100 newspapers. Her radio commentaries, uh, which have aired since 1983, are heard daily on 460 stations, and she has conducted a call-in talk show on education uh, heard on, in, on 45 stations. Uh, she's an articulate advocate of the conservative movement and has testified uh, before more than 50 congressional and state legislative committees. Uh, she's appeared on virtually every national television and radio talk show and has lectured or, deba or debated uh, more than 500 college and university campuses. She was named one of the 100 most important women of the 20th century by the Ladies' Home Journal. Uh, and third, we will hear from, and we are pleased to have uh, uh, Professor Gail Harriet. Uh, she's a professor of law at the University of San Diego and a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, her work has appeared in such legal journals as the Michigan Law Review and the Virginia Law Review and in the popular press, including the Wall Street Journal, the Nas National Review, and the Los Angeles Times. She's the editor and an author of a forthcoming anthology of essays entitled California Dreaming, Race, Gender, Pop uh, Proposition 209 and the Principle of Non-Discrimination. 
Uh, Professor Harriet is a former civil rights counsel to the U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary and a former associate dean for academic affairs at George Mason University Law School. She's a member of the board of directors of the National Association of Scholars. Before entering the academy, she practiced law at uh, Hogan and Hartson and uh, at Mayor Brown and Platt and clerked for Justice Seymour Simon of the Supreme Court of Illinois. She's a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School and Northwestern uh, University. Uh, this is an outstanding uh, panel and I think will present to you a, diverg a divergence of views and perspectives uh, uh, on the topic. Uh, let me also mention though that uh, there was a great deal of, uh, of discussion publicly uh, um, from some members of Congress last spring about uh, rejuvenating uh, the Equal uh, Rights Amendment and the and the Federalist Society had made a, a diligent effort, uh, particularly through contacts with those, uh, with those congressional offices, uh, but also through other efforts to, uh, uh, to, to try to get uh, an advocate of uh, reenacting the Equal Rights Amendment since there was so much discussion of it. But despite uh, uh, numerous uh, efforts to do that, uh, uh, no speakers were, uh, uh, were available or, or willing to, uh, to be here. So, that, so that's, th that is unfortunate, although uh, shouldn't detract from what I think will be uh, a really vi invigorating discussion uh, today. Uh, now, for the, uh, now for the ground rules, uh, what we've agreed to is that each of these uh, panelists will speak for, uh, uh, for 12 uh, uninterrupted uh, minutes in the sequence in which they've been uh, 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 introduced. And uh, uh, in, in light of uh, the title of Mrs. Schlafly's uh, book, I think I'll exercise the tyranny of the judiciary by being strict with the time limits. So uh, I'll let everyone finish a sentence. But other than that, after the 12 minutes, uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll be asked to uh, uh, to let the next speaker uh, present. So after each 12 minute, after the three 12 minute presentations, then each of these uh, fine panelists will be allowed uh, a two minute uh, uh, response or further comment. And then after that, uh, we will hear, uh, we will have questions uh, from you. Our, our questions are always a, r a really important part of these uh, uh, proceedings. And so I hope you'll be ready with some good questions. I'll tell you in advance though, they really do need to be questions and not statements from the floor. Uh, so if they're statements from the floor, I'll be tyrannical again and, and, cut, and cut you off because we really do want an opportunity for you to engage in a question and answer with the panelist and not uh, to pretend that you're uh, a panelist uh, yourself. Uh, <laughs> so uh, with that in mind, uh, uh, let's begin and hear first from uh, Professor Davis. Thanks. Uh, it's exciting to be here, and um, it's a privilege to share the stage with uh, these very accomplished women on my left and Judge Smith on my right. Um, I'm speaking first as the only proponent, I believe, of, uh, on stage here of the traditional ERA. And uh, even though I'm in the minority on the panel, my position seems to be in the majority nationwide. A 2001 poll conducted by the Well-Respected Opinion Research Corporation indicated that 96% of Americans believe that women and men should have equal rights. And I would guess that, given that percentage, many of you share this view. Um, of course, believing in equal rights is different than supporting the ERA. But the poll also showed that 88% of Americans want the ERA adopted into the US Constitution. And 72% think it's already there. So what are we doing here? Um, so these, uh, these poll results present a challenge for both the proponents and opponents of the ERA. For ERA supporters, it's a challenge to show why the ERA is actually needed when so many Americans don't realize it's not already the law. Uh, and for opponents, there's the challenge of bucking the overwhelming support for gender equality, and that's hard. It's a principle that most Americans have benefited from immensely, personally and professionally and individually and collectively. So with that as a backdrop, uh, let's turn to the question of why we need an, ERA, need an ERA if we need one. One question to ask, since so many Americans think we already have one, is what might actually change if there was a federal ERA? And for this, we don't have to guess. Our federal system provides some concrete answers. Since 22 states have adopted versions of the Equal Rights Amendment into their own state constitutions. State governments, including state courts, have been implementing these ERAs for more than a generation, in some cases more than a century. Some of the western states have very venerable ERAs. Uh, 
While the federal ERA will have its own unique meaning, defined by its legislative history, these state examples can give us some real data about the impact of a federal ERA. First, a federal ERA would almost certainly result in a higher level of constitutional scrutiny for sex-based classifications than the current intermediate scrutiny applied under federal law. A recent survey by Professor Linda Horton of cases brought under state ERAs, ERAs found that this was a common thread between the states, though because of the unique histories of each ERA, it wasn't true of, of every state. And this um, uh, uh, study was an empirical study. This is also the conclusion, I'm sorry, of an empirical study published in the Journal of Legal Studies by Baldez, Epstein, and Martin in 2001. Now, there are a few states that followed federal equal protection law in construing their ERAs and applied intermediate scrutiny, but the majority of state courts found that a central reason their state ERA was enacted was to treat sex discrimination with the same degree of care as racial discrimination and that that meant a higher level of review. There's a lot to recommend this approach. Uh, intermediate scrutiny is a confusing and ill-defined standard with some very subjective elements. Subjecting sex discrimination to strict scrutiny would provide consistency across comparable classifications. And ultimately, strict scrutiny provides for less judicial discretion because there are fewer circumstances where discrimination can be justified in the face of such scrutiny. And this was uh, part of the empirical study that I mentioned. Second, state ERAs teach us that even though both sex-based and race-based classifications would be subject to strict scrutiny, there still would be differences in how these classifications would be treated. For example, states with ERAs have carved out different approaches to privacy in gender cases. So, for example, the Attorney General, in implementing the Equal Rights Amendment in Maryland, permitted single-sex facilities for homeless women, many of whom were likely fleeing domestic violence. And no state has mandated co-ed co bathrooms, though we've all obviously had experiences with such bathrooms in our homes and airplane dorms or using family bathrooms in public settings. But to my knowledge, uh, no one's brought a case under any state ERA challenging public single-sex bathrooms. States have also made exceptions for physical characteristics unique to one sex. Now, construed too broadly, this exception could have the effect of undermining the ERA's impact, since those characteristics and differences may themselves actually be the basis of gender, gender discrimination. Pregnancy and related conditions are a good example. Under a state ERA, there will likely be no problem with offering, for example, breastfeeding rooms only to women, since only women breastfeed. Um, but there would be an equality problem uh, with then saying that negative treatment on the basis of breastfeeding or on the basis of pregnancy uh, is okay. In general, state courts construing state ERAs have rejected this perversion of the principle, um, and in so doing have rejected the approach taken by the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, notoriously in the Gadaldig versus Aiello case, where the court concluded that discrimination against pregnant people did not constitute sex discrimination. Based on the state ERA evidence, we can fairly expect that a federal ERA would have the effect of doing away with that much criticized Gadolgi principle. And I'll be curious to hear from Professor Harriet about how the California Constitution would treat this issue, whether that law would view ameliorative provisions that recognize physical differences as pressure, preferential treatment, or whether it would uh, uh, permit those kinds of provisions. Third, some have argued that a federal ERA would expand abortion rights and create grounds supporting same-sex marriage. Several state courts and states with ERAs have examined these issues. Um, first, on the abortion issue, some states, notably Connecticut and New Mexico, have held that their ERAs require state funding of medically necessary abortions for low-income women. However, some states, like New Jersey, have reached the um, same conclusion under their due process clause an analogs. And some states, with their own ERAs, like Florida or most recently Maryland, have not required state funding of medically necessary abortions for low-income women at all. So the presence of or absence of an ERA doesn't seem to uh, uh, be especially significant to the courts in looking at this issue. Likewise, one state court, Hawaii, um, invoked its state ERA in considering same-sex marriage. The Hawaiian legislature immediately responded to override the court decision. Other states with ERAs have not felt that the ERA required such a result. Indeed, in Massachusetts, my home state, the one state that offers a truly equal married right um, to um, same-sex couples found that the right to same-sex marriage based on, found that right, rather, based on the state's fundamental rights doctrine using rational basis review rather than the state's ERA. Though one judge cited the ERA, but the majority didn't rely on it. Still, if these were social issues that were of special significance to you, you might be concerned that a federal ERA would invite courts to do something unpredictable that perhaps you wouldn't like. Um, I think, however, that uh, undue concern about this possibility is misplaced. Again, we can learn about where the federal ERA might lead by looking at the general reception that state ERAs have received in their states when courts have ruled on controversial issues. 
And there's virtually no evidence that courts have gotten out ahead of state citizens and construed the ERA more expansively than its supporters intended when the ERA was enacted. No state ERA has been repealed. Uh, states did rescind uh, their approval of the federal ERA, but no state ERA has been repealed. While the same-sex marriage ruling in Massachusetts prompted a legislative battle, that effort didn't urge repeal of the ERA, uh, or in that, in that case, the State Equal Protection Clause, which is the basis for the decision. The same is true in Hawaii in the wake of the same-sex marriage ruling. The outcome of the case was under attack, but the state ERA survived. I think this is telling. States frequently amend constitutions. The Iowa Constitution has been amended an average of once every three years since its adoption. Alabama's Constitution has been uh, amended 618 times since uh, the 19th century. California's have been amended around 500 times. In short, in states, there's a real give and take between legislators, courts, and the electorate. And if state citizens believe that the ERAs were being misconstrued by their courts or other branches of government that are implementing the ERA, then surely there would have been some successful repeal efforts. Now, I think um, the evidence from states is predictive, I believe, of what, um, what a federal ERA would bring. There are only a handful of areas that I know of where federal law remains sex-specific. In two of them, women's registration for the military and women in combat, there's a lively public debate uh, about the proper uh, approach. And while the ERA might put a thumb on the scale in favor of equality, uh, the prior U.S. Supreme Court decisions on the, in this area have given considerable deference to the executive and the legislature in the exercise of their war powers and authority over the military. Um, one thing to note is that many factors contribute to court decisions, and the uh, empirical study that I mentioned earlier found that one of the um, important predictors was the number of women on the bench, uh, aside from what the uh, ap applicable law was. Um, so that's one of the things that we have to think about in, in thinking about what the impact of the ERA would be. Um, uh, an ERA would provide an occasion for re revisiting the issue of women in combat and, and registration of, women, of men only, um, which is appropriate, I think, given the tremendous social and technological changes since 1973 and the level of interest in the issue. But the outcome is certainly not clear under an ERA, and I frankly think that's unlikely that the court would be pr providing leadership in this area. Another existing federal law, considered in Nguyen versus INS, the case that I unsuccessfully argued to the Supreme Court, discriminates against fathers by denying them the same rights to pass on citizenship to their foreign-born children that are enjoyed by mothers. And here I, I do think the court got it wrong. I actually believe what I argued to the court. And um, that, it, <laughs> that an ERA would, uh, would help remedy the situation by imposing strict scrutiny. But I also don't believe that, this, that reversing this result would be terribly controversial. Uh, there's a tremendous support from both men and women for equalizing parental responsibilities and parental rights. Now, strict scrutiny would also have an impact on the availability of affirmative action uh, for women. But frankly, given the constraints currently put on affirmative action programs um, by, the, by the Supreme Court, that impact is not so great. As a de facto matter, affirmative action programs for women are already held to a high level of scrutiny because to do otherwise would create the anomaly of striking down programs for racial minorities while upholding programs for women. In sum, the most significant effect of a popularly approved federal ERA would not be to increase judicial involvement in setting social policy, but to put some limits on the court's discretion, since strict scrutiny would be required rather than the more standardless intermediate scrutiny. And by recognizing the seriousness of sex discrimination, strict scrutiny would have a real and beneficial, though not dramatic, impact on women's and men's rights. Let me add one more observation about the benefits of adopting a federal ERA. In addition to limiting judicial discretion and potentially increasing equality between men and women in positive ways, the ERA, the ERA would enhance U.S. standing among other nations and undermine those nations that maintain sex, dis sex discrimination as a matter of public policy. From an international perspective, the U.S. record on women's rights is undistinguished. We haven't ratified the CEDAW, the Women's Rights Convention. We haven't had a women president. Our represent women's representation in Congress is low. Uh, and to top it off, our Constitution offer offers no specific sex equality protection. The international community is aware of this, and some are intent on using it to criticize the U.S. on the international stage. For example, the U.N. Human Rights Committee issued uh, findings last summer uh, specifically criticizing U.S. failure to adopt a more comprehensive laws addressing sex discrimination. They said, quote, the U.S. should take all steps necessary to ensure the equality of women before the law. In the 1990s, the Human Rights Committee was more direct and asked the Clinton administration specifically whether uh, the U.S. wasn't out of compliance with its international obligations because of failure to adopt the ERA. Um, the ERA's absence is particularly glaring in light of the constitutional provisions adopted by sister nations, Canada, the nations of Europe through their European Convention on Human Rights, uh, that do address sex discrimination. 
Um, now, I admit that implementation of CEDAW in the U.S. would be complicated. There are a number of provisions that, that differ from U.S. domestic law, would have to be reconciled in some way. But the ERA is our law. It's drafted in a way that is consistent with our venerable Constitution. The legislative history and interpretation of the ERA will reflect our domestic debate and decision making, and it'll go a long way to answering critics who criticize the U.S. failure to, to pr provide adequate legal protection from sex discrimination. Of course, we can't ignore these international, we can ignore these international critiques and take the position that U.S. is exceptional, the U.S. can stand alone, uh, but in a globalized world, our failure to adopt basic legal standards of gender equality through the ERA or through CEDAW won't be a secret for long, either from our own citizens or from others around the world, even though this ORC poll suggests that it is a secret maybe from our own, uh, our own uh, people. Okay, so once again, uh, as in the 1970s, we have a choice, and given what I've said about the likely impact of the federal ERA at this, at this stage of our country's development, what we might gain, what we might lose, I think the price of not ratifying it is too high to pay. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Judge Smith and members of the Federalist Society. Uh, Congress voted out the proposed Equal Rights Amendment in March 1972 by big majorities, and it was quickly ratified by 30 of the 38 states it needed. ERA was supported by all the presidents, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, and by all the prominent politicians from Ted Kennedy to George Wallace, and by 99% of the media. What stopped ERA was the state legislative hearings, that was the only forum where both sides had an equal chance to present their case. ERA states, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That was a strict, uncompromising statement, and neither equality of rights nor sex was defined. The advocates told us that ERA would put women in the Constitution, but that was easily refuted. ERA did not mention women, it only mentioned sex. And men are not in the Constitution. The Constitution is a perfect sex-neutral document, using only sex-neutral terms such as we the people, citizen, resident, person, president, and representative. The principal reason that ERA failed is that although it was marketed as a benefit to women, its advocates were never able to prove that ERA would provide any benefit whatsoever to women. ERA advocates had enormous access to the media because the media were overwhelmingly on their side. They used that media access to whine that women's wages were not equal with men's, suggesting that ERA would remedy this disparity. However, when their lawyers spoke at legislative hearings, they could not make that argument because they knew ERA would have no effect on wages. What ERA would do would be to make all of our laws sex neutral, and our employment laws were already sex neutral before ERA was passed by Congress. The Equal Pay for Equal Work Law was passed in 1963, and the Equal Employment Opportunity Act with its enforcement mechanisms was passed in 1972. It became obvious that the first effect of ERA, if it were ratified, would be to change the military draft law from male citizens of age 18 to persons of age 18, and that therefore girls would be drafted and sent into military combat just like men. In those years, we had a military draft, and we were just emerging from the Vietnam War. No ERA advocate ever denied this effect. In fact, their leading legal scholar, Yale professor Thomas I. Emerson, bragged about it in the 100-page article he wrote about ERA in the Yale Law Journal. But that was simply an unsaleable proposition. In 1972, the United States had dozens, perhaps hundreds of state laws that recognized the wife and mother in the home and her right of support by her husband. We could show that these laws were all at risk from the absolute language of ERA. In fact, when ERA was voted on by the Senate, numerous amendments were proposed to safeguard the rights of wives and mothers, and all were defeated by the ERA advocates who wanted to use the power of the U.S. Constitution to force us into a gender-neutral society. All their lawyers stoutly maintained they wanted sex to be treated exactly like race.
The effect of ERA on same-sex marriage licenses was an issue where the marketing did not match up with the opinions of legal experts. Harvard Law Professor uh, Paul Freund and Michigan Law Professor James White, an article in the Yale Law Journal, and the chief constitutional lawyer in the U.S. Senate, Sam Irvin, were among those who said that the absolute language of ERA would require same-sex marriage licenses. The effect of ERA in assisting abortion became apparent when the ACLU began litigating for abortion funding in states that had passed a state ERA constitutional amendment. The, they didn't win every one of these cases, but they won big when the New Mexico State Supreme Court ruled that New Mexico's state ERA overturned state law and requires taxpayer funding of abortions. Through most of the 10 years that ERA was debated nationally, ACLU lawyer Ruth Bader Ginsburg was their leading legal authority. She wrote a book which was published by the U.S. Civil Rights Commission setting forth precisely what changes ERA would bring about in our laws. She states in this book that the concept of husband breadwinner and dependent wife who cares for children and household must be eliminated from our laws if they are to reflect the equality principle. Her book proves that ERA is a direct attack on traditional social security benefits to the dependent wife in recognition of her role as full-time homemaker. It's interesting that both Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Thomas I. Emerson's definition of ERA-style equality includes affirmative action for women, especially in order to equalize their numbers in the military. Judge Ginsburg's book spells out dozens of other changes in our laws that ERA would require, most of which are contrary to our culture and the wishes of the American people. For example, she said ERA would abolish the words husband and wife and replace them with spouse. ERA would require the government to provide comprehensive child care. ERA re would require the sex uh, integration of all schools and colleges, fraternities, sororities, prisons, reformatories, and even Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. And her 230-page book made no reference at all to employment, or to women's wages, equal pay was not an ERA issue, as she had to concede. At the state hearings, we also showed that ERA would give vast new power to the judges to tell us what ERA means, what sex and what equality of rights mean after ratification. And ERA section two would give vast new powers to the Congress over all matters that make any difference on account of sex, such as family law. When ERA came out of Congress, it was given a time period of seven years to achieve ratification. As the years went on and the advocates were not able to show any benefit to women, but we could show very many bad effects, states began saying no. ERA was then ratified by only five additional states, but five other states changed their minds and rescinded their previous ratifications. So the net score of the last six years was zero. ERA advocates then persuaded President Carter and Congress to give them a three-year extension, but the public saw that as like giving three extra innings to a baseball game that was not tied up. Public reaction was so adverse that not a single additional state ratified ERA during the time extension. ERA actually lost support during those years. In the lawsuit called Idaho versus Freeman, the U.S. District Court ruled that the ERA time extension was unconstitutional and that rescissions are constitutional. When the Idaho case was appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, it was dismissed as moot because ERA failed of adoption, no matter whether it died at the, the end of the original seven years or the end of the extended time period. Meanwhile, ERA advocates were, uh, were introducing amendments to state constitutions to ban sex discrimination. About 15 state amendments were passed in the early 1970s. However, there is significant difference in their wording. 
Only six states use the language substantially the same as the proposed federal ERA. And so those states have provoked the most extensive litigation. They are Hawaii, Colorado, Maryland, Washington, New Mexico, and Pennsylvania. Hawaii was the first state to rule that ERA requires same-sex marriage licenses, and the voters had to overturn that by another state constitutional amendment. New Mexico is the state that most extensively accepted the feminist argument that it is sex discrimination to deny any taxpayer funding for abortions. Many of the other state constitutional amendments should not be called ERAs at all. Illinois, for example, uses the equal protection language of the 14th Amendment, which we know does not require women to be drafted. Louisiana states, no law shall arbitrarily, capriciously, or unreasonably discriminate against a person on account of sex. Virginia exempts separation of the sexes from the ban on sex discrimination. After the state legislatures began defeating the federal ERA because of the powerful arguments against it, the public turned strongly against ERA. It was a shock to many when the people of New York State and New Jersey both defeated ERA on statewide referenda. S similar ERA referenda were soundly defeated in Florida and Nevada. After the federal ERA died on June 30th, 1982, the ERA advocates made a tremendous effort to revive their fortunes by state ERA referenda in Maine and then in Vermont which they considered were two states easy to win. But ERA lost by the voters in both states. The last attempt on the ballot was made in Iowa, where ERA was defeated for the second time in a statewide referendum in 1992. The Equal Rights Amendment is a thoroughly bad idea, and that's why a majority of states are now on record against ERA. It has no benefits for women and tremendous detriments, especially to women. The results that ERA would enforce on our military, on social security, on marriage licenses, and on abortion funding are contrary to current law and to our culture. The attempt now to revive ERA by telling people that 25 years after the Supreme Court declared it dead, and by counting the ratifications but not the five rescissions, that ERA can be put into our Constitution if ratified by three more states is completely dishonest. Concepts such as equality and fairness should not be advanced through dishonest procedures. Thank you. If someone had told me 35 years ago uh, that one day I would be standing on a dais with Mrs. Shapley debating a now newly revived effort to pass ERA uh, and that I would be more or less on her side, uh, I would not have believed it. Um, obviously something has fundamentally changed uh, in my way of thinking. Uh, and, and I see from the looks on a few people's faces, you're thinking, yes, I understand. I used to be a liberal, too. Now I've become a conservative. But, you know, honestly, that's not it with me. Uh, my change isn't that I have become a conservative, although I have. I think it's that be I became a lawyer, um, quite apart from the politics um, of all this. I learned something about the craft of lawyering and about the gentle art of drafting language that accomplishes the goal that you have in mind and not what you didn't have in mind. Um, in 1972, uh, Mrs. Schlafly was a lawyer, I believe, um, and she recognized that those words, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex, uh, that those words might have unintended consequences. Um, indeed, they might even have a few stealth consequences intended by a few, uh, but not by the rank and file uh, majority uh, supporters of ERA. 
uh, but that's neither here nor there right now. Nevertheless, uh, she was reviled um, by some. Uh, many accused her of fomenting hysteria uh, when she argued, for example, that such language could be used to argue uh, in favor of gay marriage. Uh, now, regardless of what anybody thinks uh, about gay marriage, about that issue today, at the time, it had absolutely no political traction. Zero, zilch, none. Uh, had citizens thought that the language could be so construed, the majority of supporters would surely uh, have insisted that the language be altered uh, or that the matter be dropped. But leaders of the movement insisted that Mrs. Schlafly, uh, that her warnings were completely uh, unfounded. Uh, 35 years have now passed since Congress uh, originally passed the ERA, and guess what? Um, state constitutions with ERA-like cl clauses have indeed uh, been, been uh, used as the, as the basis for arguments uh, that if a state does recognize marriage between a man and a woman, it must also recognize marriage between a man and a man uh, and a woman and a woman. And one court in California has indeed uh, bought that argument uh, hook, line, and sinker. It's a little hard to argue with Mrs. Schlafly's analysis now. Uh, regardless of your view of gay marriage, uh, regardless of your view of women in combat, uh, of women in the draft, of co-ed bathrooms even, uh, what have you, uh, it's simply the case uh, that these uh, amendments have been used for that purpose. Now part of the problem uh, with the Equal Rights Amendment uh, was that it was originally drafted back in 1923 and then it was redrafted into its present form in the 1940s, decades before it was actually adopted by Congress uh, in 1972, and a lot happened after uh, that language uh, was crafted and put into the form that it continues to be in today. Um, before Brown versus the Board of Education, for example, one could imagine someone assuming that separate but equal facilities uh, would not violate uh, the proposed amendment. But after that decision, it would be a mistake to assume, to assume that. When Title VII uh, of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was being considered, its supporters recognized that a flat ban on race discrimination uh, works better than a flat ban on sex discrimination. So they added a little bit of flexibility uh, into, into the, uh, the language of the act. Uh, they added what they called bona fide uh, occupational qualifications based on sex. It was meant to be, and in fact is, uh, an exception of limited scope, applies mainly to issues of sexual privacy and theatrical authenticity. Uh, no similar exception uh, appears in the ERA. Um, when I sat down um, to think about my remarks for today, I started wondering to myself whether I would be willing to support the ERA today if it could be drafted a little better than it is now. Uh, I have a very liberal friend, uh, in fact, not just my friend, this is my sister, uh, who told me um, that she doubted, she is not a conservative like me, she doubted that someone like me, a member of the Federalist Society after all, could ever support uh, the iconic cause of the left uh, that the ERA is. But, but let me lay out a few suggested changes. Uh, that I believe that 90% of the amendment's rank and file supporters uh, would have gone for in 1972, uh, and it might be a similar number today. Uh, first, it should include a, a clause for bona fide qualifications uh, that would allow states and the federal government, for that matter, uh, to maintain separate bathrooms, for goodness sake, uh, and the authenticity of the theater roles. Theater goers in Shakespeare's time, of course, um, didn't mind female impersonators and roles for Romeo and Juliet and such, but that can be kind of distracting uh, in the era of the close-up uh, that we have today. Um, there is a large body um, of law now applying bona fide occupational um, qualifications exceptions to Title VII in employment cases which can be obliquely referenced um, in the proposal. Second, uh, we need to recognize 
that certain issues are just too controversial even today to be governed by a constitutional amendment upsetting the status quo um, on these issues. So I would propose, for example, um, that we have uh, an initiative that would limit the application to those areas where I think there is a lot of consensus. Public employment, um, public contracting, uh, public education. Um, and third, um, I think that we need to make it clear that in keeping with the original spirit of the ERA um, and other civil rights uh, laws during that era, that the legislation should be a two-way street. Um, and that is neither discrimination against nor preferential treatment for women uh, should be tolerated. These modifications, I believe, are, are pretty minor uh, and completely in keeping with what most Americans who supported the ERA back in the 1970s uh, understood the ERA to mean and wanted it to mean. Uh, question is, would I support it now? Um, or is my sister right um, that um, there's nothing in the world that could get me to support something like this? And my response is, for goodness sake, I have already supported uh, that initiative. Indeed, I have spent the last 12 years of my life attempting, successfully I might add, um, to pass popular initiatives that amend state constitutions and state law to include exactly such language. Proposition 209 in California, for example, states uh, that, and I quote here, uh, the state shall not discriminate against or grant preferential treatment to any individual or group on the ground of, among others, it includes race and, and, and color and ethnicity, but sex um, in the operation of public education, public employment, and public contracting. It contains an exception for bona fide qualifications uh, based on sex, um, unlike the ERA. Um, and it's passed in California, and very similar language um, has passed um, in, in Michigan um, and in uh, the state of Washington as well. Now, you might ask what position um, for example, did the National Organization of Women or the Coalition for Feminist uh, Majority take uh, with regard to Proposition 209? Well, you might remember uh, that they opposed it. And indeed, that is understatement. They fought it with every ounce of strength they had in their bodies. Uh, this was a very, very unpopular initiative uh, because it outlawed preferences. Uh, preferences which in fact are a very important part of the law today um, and the NOW and Coalition of Feminist Majority not only opposed Proposition 209, uh, they funded all sorts of advertisements against it Two and minutes. one that um, in particular um, ran in California uh, was an ad that ran basically in the, in the two weeks before election day, uh, depicting a woman doctor dressed as a doctor with male hands reaching in and pulling away her stethoscope, pulling away her lab coat, till finally she was stripped down to her underwear. Um, the message was a very ugly one and an untrue one, that without gender preferences, no woman would be admitted to the medical prof profession or indeed any other learned profession. Uh, we would be left out in the cold. Um, well, this leads me to the question, uh, why feminist groups would be promoting a renewed effort to pass the ERA given the modern reality of preferences for women, particularly in the area of public contracting? Um, and the answer is that I don't really know. Um, why last spring there was an effort to revive um, ERA in this regard, uh, but there it is. Uh, but I would like to argue that maybe there's a reason that, that, that there should be um, some interest not in uh, ERA as currently drafted, but an ERA that would be more along the lines of Proposition 209. 
why even those feminists who oppose Proposition 209 perhaps should start thinking about this anew. Um, when we passed Prop Proposition 209, most of the preferences that we found in California were definitely in favor of women. But this was not always so. We did find one particular case um, that involved um, a nursing school which gave preferences to men. Well, in an era in which women are now a, a majority of those who, who apply to law schools and medical schools and are 56% um, of the undergraduates um, in colleges and universities, perhaps it's time to worry uh, as some universities have started to discriminate uh, in favor of men um, in their applications to college. And perhaps, um, perhaps um, now and the Coalition for a Feminist Majority uh, will start being interested um, in an ERA, ERA that reflects Proposition 209's principles uh, instead of the original. <laughs> Uh, in, in just a minute, we're going to uh, uh, ask each panelist to give a, a two-minute uh, <clears throat> commentary or a response. Uh, but just for a minute, if they've brought some extra chairs in, and there are other empty chairs scattered around, so I, I'm just going to take about one minute. If any of you want to relocate yourselves, please feel free to do so. I know people are hesitant to move around during, while a speaker is, is speaking, so uh, now would be the time to uh, take advantage of of some of the empty uh, chairs, and or if you're standing, you're certainly welcome to uh, to sit. Uh, the, the, the popularity of this panel over, over overwhelms us, and that's a that's a tribute to the quality of these of these three uh, uh, panelists. And and so we we're delighted to have uh, have the good uh, have the good turnout. So uh, if anyone else wants to uh, quickly uh, reposition yourself, you can you can go ahead and do that. All right, for a two-minute uh, comment, uh, Professor <coughs> Davis. Okay, well, <coughs> excuse me, thank you. Um, a, a couple of um, points. Uh, one is uh, the, the, my fellow panelists have critiqued the language of the um, current ERA proposal, and I certainly, uh, as you know, there have been different versions throughout the um, decades that people have debated this. Um, and there's another version uh, out there besides the one that was proposed in Congress, which is one that was drafted by um, has been supported by the National Organization for Women called the Constitutional Equality Amendment, um, which is much more specific, but also uh, much less in keeping with the nature of our Constitution. I think one of the values that the current ERA brings, uh, the current draft, is that it's very consistent with the way our Constitution um, leaves to statute to be, and to, and to the executive and to the legislature to be more specific about what exactly um, how exactly that's going to be implemented, and, and to judges as well. Um, a more specific provision wouldn't do that. But, but one of the concerns then is that um, uh, instead of embracing um, that consistency, um, that uh, my colleagues on the panel have used that to actually attack the area. And that seems to me in some way to be um, uh, disingenuous because, uh, in fact, was there a specific ERA before them that set out um, uh, you know, various uh, issues that would be addressed, but I would guess that they would also have difficulty with that. Um, and so the real concern that they have, I think, is around the nature of these social issues and not about the wording of the ERA. Um, now, one, one just point of, um, I guess, uh, clarification with what um, Mrs. Schlafly said. She talked about the way state ERAs had been um, construed, and she accurately indicated that not all of them uh, are uh, worded in the same way as the federal ERA. Um, and she talked about New Mexico as being one worded like the federal ERA that had upheld um, uh, um, state-funded abortions. The Pennsylvania ERA is worded like the federal ERA and has not been construed that way. So there is a difference even with the identical language in the way states have approached those. So you can't, again, as I said, um, uh, you can't say with any definitive, um, definitive um, uh, uh, you know, resolve that the federal ERA would result in these things because the state areas have not been construed that way and the legislative history makes a great difference in, in how they're construed. Uh, and then finally, neither of the um, uh, folks here 
um, on the panel with me, talked about uh, the Gadolga issue, and I'd be interested in both of their views on that, um, particularly uh, Professor Harriet, you talked about the um, uh, Prop 209, and I'm curious, as I said earlier, as to whether or not you believe that that Prop 209 uh, holds that discrimination on the basis of um, physical characteristics that are unique to one sex are barred, or whether you think that that would be permitted under Prop 209 in some way. So does Prop 209 overrule Gadolgig in Ta California? The ERA is marketed as uh, putting women in the Constitution, a benefit to women. And we have not heard any benefit to women in ERA. There just isn't any. In 41 state legislative hearings where I testified, the only time an advocate came in and said, our state has a state law that discriminates against women that ERA will remedy, was in North Dakota, where they said they have a state law that says that women can, wives cannot make homemade wine without their husband's consent. <laughs> For this, we need a constitutional amendment. Now, of course, it is true we cannot predict exactly uh, where the tyranny of the judges will lead us, because equality of rights and sex are not defined. Is it the sex you are or the sex you do? And we saw in, it, it didn't say. <laughs> and so in these uh, states that have taken up uh, uh, the uh, same-sex marriage issue, uh, even though, uh, let's see, uh, some states said, yes, ERA does require uh, same-sex marriage license. Others uh, said no, but they were split decisions. Most of them were uh, just uh, by one vote. So uh, are you going to be an originalist like Justice Scalia and stick with the text of it, which is very clear and absolute, or are you going to go with the intent, and, some, and the intent has been uh, different, uh, are you going to go with emerging awareness about sexual mores? Who knows what the judges are going to do? Now, uh, I, I was surprised at, at what uh, Professor Davis said about um, military combat and drafting women. No advocate ever denied the effect on drafting women in the 10 years of dis debate about the Equal Rights Amendment. They all came in and said, yes, that is what we want. And that is confirmed both in Professor Emerson's uh, major article in the Yale Law Journal and in Ruth Bader Ginsburg's uh, book on the ERA. And uh, then you come to the definition of equality of rights. That's not defined uh, uh, also. But equality of rights, in their view, includes affirm affirmative action for women, Thanks. and specifically affirmative action in the military to equalize the numbers. Professor Harriet. Okay, I see we already have people who are ready to ask questions, so I will, I will be very brief here. I just wanted to make a couple of com comments. Uh, one on the notion of applying strict scrutiny um, to, to sex discrimination. Um, and the point I wanted to make is that if you're having to read privacy exceptions into the language uh, of ERA, uh, yes, it's true that if you give some state courts uh, I, an amendment to the con their state constitutions that are that are that is worded basically the way the ERA was 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 worded. Some of them will look at that and say, "Well, it doesn't really mean um, absolutely no sex discrimination." It will say, "Okay, look, uh, separate bathrooms, that's okay." Uh, but there's a downside of reading something like that into the language when it's not there. The downside of that is if we water down our interpretation uh, of a ban on sex discrimination, does that mean we will then water down our interpretation uh, of a, a race discrimination case as well? And I don't favor that. I favor very, very strict rules against race discrimination with almost nothing in the way of exception. Uh, so I don't want to see uh, a gender discrimination uh, ban that ends up weighing down uh, the strict level of scrutiny that's applied to race discrimination. I see that as a real danger. Another issue I wanted to bring up um, is this notion of, of, you know, we can depend upon the courts um, to, to make sense of our laws and our constitutional provisions. Back in, 19, in 1970s, uh, the argument was, don't worry, the courts will do the right thing. 
Uh, and you know, th those liberals thought that that was true. They liked the judiciary at the time. Uh, I don't know what they feel about the judiciary now. They, they, I, I doubt they are as, as, as fond of the judiciary because it's, it's, it's more conservative now than it was then. Uh, and what are we to say about the judiciary of the year, you know, 2030? Uh, I intend to be around there th at that point, and I hope that things are, 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 you know, being interpreted the way I want them to be. Uh, but I don't know how any of us can depend upon that. That's why it's best to just get the language right in the first place. Thank you. All right. Thanks to all your the panelists for your uh, for your presentations. Now we'll move to questions. And just again to to go over the ground rules. As I said before. Uh, it really should be a question, uh, some, some genuine response that you would like from, from one or more of the panelists, but as to any question, all three panelists are welcome uh, to uh, uh, respond. Uh, secondly, uh, no follow-up questions. Uh, we want to give everyone a chance to ask one question, and if everyone in the room who wants to has asked a question, then if s someone wants to stand up again and do a follow-up, that's probably going to be okay if we, to the extent that we, uh, that we have time. I just ask those who are asking questions, please, not to take unfair advantage of the, uh, of the microphone, and let's continue the, uh, uh, the genuine dialogue uh, that we've already had. All right, first question. Thank you, Judge Smith. Uh, the, uh, and Professor Davis, I, you're probably going to get most of the questions, and I appreciate your courage in coming to the lion's den here. I, I wanted the question that I wanted to ask. It was uh, what Professor Harriet was talking about, just right there. On if if we're talking about strict scrutiny in the context of racial discrimination, and if a public school had racially segregated bathrooms or racially segregated student basketball teams. Uh, the law would process, process that in a certain way and I think declare both of those unconstitutional. But I think instinctively, if they had girls and boys basketball teams or girls and boys bathrooms, and I think that the, air, the airline example is not helpful because it's only a single stall one and it's, if it's a man in there, it's a men's room and if a woman's in there, it's a woman's room. So I, I think that the airline bathroom doesn't help. When you, you know, locker rooms and all of that, um, if they were racially segregated versus gender segregated, it seems like uh, the same standard of strict scrutiny would process those differently. And if we put a law that processed them exactly the same, we're either going to get a harsh result in the gender context or a watered down context uh, uh, result in the racial context. Okay, I think yeah, I think we have your your, your right. question. It's a good question, and I think we I think thank we have you. it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That is a good question, and it's a. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a good point that if these are, are linked that um, uh, there's going to be more give and take between the standards. That's true. And of course that's one of the reasons that uh, women's rights advocates are supporting the ERA is because um, uh, of the concern that women's discrimination against women isn't taken as seriously now as it would be if it was the same standard as race discrimination. On the bathroom issue, as I, as I said, that of course it has been the bathroom issue not per se, but the issue of privacy has been a, a, a question that um, the state courts have dealt with, and what they've done is say that we will um, uh, read into the ERA a kind of a, um, a privacy exception. And that's part of the legislative history that was part of the federal ERA as well. The, um, Phil Schlafly mentioned the famous article by Thomas Emerson and some of his colleagues at Yale, uh, which set out um, uh, uh, um, sort of definitions of the ERA that was then incorporated into the congressional record, so it became part of uh, the legislative history of that, that said that we're not going to um, back away from cultural uh, differences, cultural um, uh, uh, things that we're comfortable with, like, like single-sex bathrooms, uh, but that in other respects that strict scrutiny will, will apply. And the state courts that have dealt with this, have, I guess, have not had difficulty with it. And as I said, um, there hasn't been any sort of uproar about the way in which the ERA was applied in this context. There isn't any lobby that I know of for same-sex bathrooms. It's, just, it's simply a, I mean, the bathroom issue in particular is, a, is, is really a, a, a red herring. Um, if we're talking about um, uh, homeless shelters or domestic violence shelters, I think that's a more realistic example. Uh, could you have single-sex domestic <coughs> violence shelters when the women are fleeing, you know, usually men, men or women are fleeing the opposite sex and having a, another co-educational co um, uh, facility might actually undermine the, the purpose of the, of the facility. And what the people that construing this have said, Attorney Gen as I mentioned, it was the Attorney General of Maryland, not the, not, the, not the judge, have said that 
um, we, in those circumstances, will recognize the ability to have a single-sex facility, provided that there's strict equality. Um, and uh, you know, we don't know after VMI how how even the equality would be measured across the sexes under the Equal Protection Clause, but we do know under strict scrutiny. Any further? Yes, I, I would like to say in 10 years of debate, their lawyers always said, we want sex to be treated like race. We want the absolute <laughs> standard. We want a gender neutral society. And the bathroom argument, they, de they treated with ridicule. They never addressed it. It was just a ridicule, a, a laugh laugh. I guess, again, you know, my concern is, is not so much fear that you know, the Supreme Court of some state is going to say uh, we have to have co-ed bathrooms. My concern is once they say uh, that's not necessary, we read a privacy exception into this, then when you go back to a race discrimination case, it's going to be hard to argue that this has got to be absolutely absolute based on, on, on language of a statute um, or whatever. Um, once you can see that language that's as absolute as the ERA contains the seeds of some exception, then what won't contain the seeds of some exception? All right, next question. Oddly enough, my question is about bathrooms and strict scrutiny, but it is a serious question, and it involves a minor crime, as did Lawrence versus Texas out of Harris County. I come out of Harris County. A few years back, an acquaintance of mine at halftime at the Rockets game in the summit wanted to go to the bathroom. The lines at the ladies' rooms were very, very long. The lines at the men's room were not. My friend went into the men's bathroom in a moment of emergency <laughs> and was charged, as was Lawrence, with a Class C misdemeanor in Harris County, disorderly conduct, sometimes out of trivial issues come major legal okay. questions. Do, do you have and a question? I, well, it, it, my question it, it, is, there were equal bathrooms. If this went to the Supreme Court under strict scrutiny, would it be equal bathrooms, equal stalls, or would it be a more important issue, enough bathrooms for women? In other words, I think this is a serious question. It's not trivial. I, I guess that was for you, Professor yeah, Davis. Yeah, yeah. I first, mean that so. goes back to the Gadoldig issue that I mentioned before. There, um, you know, I don't, I haven't been in very many men's bathrooms, so I can't comment on it personally. But um, the uh, um, Professor Marianne Case of University of Chicago actually had students uh, go out and and survey men's and women's bathrooms to try to determine whether there actually was equality. And one of the problems is not very many people you know, frequent both, and so are able to assess that. And what she found was that, um, in fact, there wasn't equality um, in terms of the actual um, spaces that were being uh, available for use um, uh, by, uh, in the ways that people want to use bathrooms um, uh, by men and women. So, um, so I think that having an equal, uh, an equal rights amendment would encourage more scrutiny of that. I, I still don't, I th still think it's unlikely that that case would go to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, but if it did, at the very least, there would be a requirement that there be, uh, I hope, uh, uh, equal opportunity to um, uh, use the bathroom um, by men and women, if not uh, co-ed bathrooms. Uh, and right now, it's not clear that that's even uh, protected. It just sounds to me like the prosecutor didn't have common sense, and it was another prosecutor out of control. I guess all I can say is God help us if ever the Supreme Court does have to evaluate this issue because it's hard enough to get people that want to be in, in, on the courts these days and go through the confirmation if they know <laughs> they're going to have to you know, try to decide which bathroom has, a, you know, has the requisite number of, of, of spaces, then yeah. nobody's going to want that. <laughs> okay, next question. What would the uh, impact on troop morale be if uh, lesbian, transgendered, questioning, and bisexual um, individuals were in uh, applying to uh, military academies and in combat. You want to start again? Or? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just used to taking the code. Somebody do, do, do you want to start? That? Maybe I, I, I'm I couldn't hear it. Uh, oh, okay. Would, uh, you you, yes. Uh, would you ask again? I uh, sorry, had had a problem hearing it. Uh, yeah, just put the. What would the impact of the ERA on troop morale be? if uh, lesbian, gay, transgendered, 
bisexual and questioning individuals were in combat and in military academies. Well, yeah, 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 go ahead. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess I'd have to answer that with I don't know. Um, I suspect it would not be good, but I don't really know, and that's exactly why I think that controversial areas, uh, it's <laughs> a, usually a very bad idea to change the status quo um, in important areas uh, by constitutional amendment, because once you've done it uh, and you've decided that maybe it was a mistake, it's really hard to go back and fix it. Well, we not only don't know what the true morale will be, we don't know what the court will do because uh, sex, again, is not defined, sex you do or se sex you are. And I will point out that when ERA was going through uh, the Senate and House, many amendments were proposed to address many of these things like the rights of wives, the military draft, uh, sexual crimes, and so forth. And they were all voted down by the uh, feminists who wanted an absolute uh, absolute total ban because their purpose was to drive us into a gender neutral society in which you are not permitted to make any difference of treatment on account of sex and they wanted to treat it just like race. Now presumably female to male transgender people are already eligible for um, combat opportunities and so on so one of the things that we're talking about is really equalizing it for uh, anyone who's had that um, uh, experience. Um, if you're asking, uh, you know, more generally about morale of uh, the troops in terms of women in the military, there's, as I said, there's a lively public debate on that, as you all know, and there are many people in the military that feel that combat uh, opportunities should be open to women, and, and, and many people who retired from the military who feel better able to speak openly about it, who talk about that, and about the impact that not having all those opportunities has on women's advancement within the military, even if they don't want to go into combat, the fact that they can't uh, can't ever do it because of military policy can prevent, can close to them other opportunities within the military. And so it, it has a significant impact on, on women in the military, even if combat is not their goal. Okay, next question. Uh, I don't think they can hear you. Can you, um, is that microphone on? Or? Uh, Ms. Davis, you used the, uh, the phrase that, or the uh, idea that the meaning of uh, uh, ERA would be uh, defined by its legislative history, which takes us into an area a lot of us are trying to, are trying to get out of. And I would like the comments of the panel uh, on the following, that in 1964, I think the, all of us pretty much knew what was meant by the term discrimination, uh, except that within five or six years in Griggs versus Duke Power, the Supreme Court said, you really don't know what discrimination is, and gave, uh, uh, took out from the term discrimination any form of mens rea, and of course gave great impetus to the then, uh, in its infancy, the uh, affirmative action industry. Uh, I'd like the comments of the uh, uh, panel on the uh, ability of the court to change the meaning of uh, plain language by using legislative intent. Um, I mean, as I said earlier, I think that's the, the nature of our Constitution, and one of the efforts of the ERA is to, is to draft something that's consistent with that. Modern so-called modern constitutions are, of course, much more specific and uh, therefore perhaps need to rely less on legislative history, but it's impossible to draft uh, you know, as we know from from drafting statutes, it's impossible to draft something that's so unambiguous that it requires no interpretation. And legislative history is one way to um, provide tools for interpretation that still come from uh, a legislative branch and from a popular uh, popular source. And I see no way around that at some level. Um, and uh, um, the ERA at this point has had considerable debate, and there's considerable legislative history associated with it. So we're not talking about something that's going to be a blank slate for any judge or any um, governor or um, other member of the executive to uh, interpret. In fact, there's going to be considerable uh, constraint on the kinds of interpretations that they could take consistent with what the intent was. 
Well, the legislative history about ERA is very powerful. Uh, there were roll call votes in the Senate and House on specific amendments uh, to uh, make exceptions in ERA. Uh, the amendment to exempt women from the military draft, to exempt them from military combat, to protect the uh, rights of wives and mothers and in terms of support, uh, to exempt uh, uh, sexual crimes. And uh, the legislative history is powerful, that it was designed to be abs absolutely strict. Now, again, you got in, in the courts, you don't know. Now, there was an early uh, case on same-sex marriage in the state of Washington, which is one of the states with the same kind of language. And they held that it, the Washington state ERA did not require same-sex marriage. Uh, and their main argument was it was, quote, obvious that that wasn't what they intended, okay? <clears throat> All right, we don't know when things are obvious. Uh, but then, of course, there was the more recent case, which was very hard fought, and same-sex marriage lost by a five to four decision. And it was uh, very well argued on both sides. So again, we get back to uh, what does equality mean? And it is clear from Ruth Bader Ginsburg and from Thomas I. Emerson that they define equality of rights to include affirmative action for women. Now, to me, that doesn't make sense, but that is their argument. Mm -hmm. Anything? I just have one additional co comment uh, in that area, and that is this notion of, of, of beautiful sounding language um, and my fear of beautiful sounding language. Um, you know, if you look at constitutions around the world and you see which constitutions use the, 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 the most, you know, perfect sounding um, monumental kind of language, it tends to be in those countries where it's just ink on paper and it doesn't mean a thing. Uh, if you look at the old Soviet constitution, there was a lot about, about you know, how, how, you know, people are equal and, you know, just this lovely language. Uh, but they didn't have to worry about how it would be interpreted because it was a, you know, it didn't mean a thing. Um, here, what is, you know, that ink on paper matters. Um, it is going to determine uh, the courses of people's lives. Uh, and therefore, I think it's impossible to, it, 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 it's important not to just, you know, look for language that's going to sound nice, uh, but language that actually can guide the courts. Uh, and I think the ERA is not that. All right, next question. Yeah, why don't you just yeah, take that out of the, yeah, just hold it and there you go. Professor Harriet, um, you talked about a proposition that would contain clauses or exceptions to protect things like, um, you know, same sex, single sex bathrooms and the like. Do you think that if we tried to adopt a federal ERA that contained these exceptions that you um, are advocating, do you think there would still be a possibility that courts may construe it that uh, we would get undesired results from an ERA like that? And then secondly, would that be the first step to actually um, passing the ERA that was proposed in the 70s where we would have the undesired results that we don't? Okay, is it possible that, that even if, if we came up with language that I thought handled things as best we could, that there would still be court decisions that I thought were, were, were bad ones? Oh, of course, absolutely, certain. Uh, there's always risk not only in whatever language you, you, you put forth, um, but there's also danger when you don't act. Um, and so the, the lack of an ERA, the lack of any such constitutional amendment, you know, bears its own risks. Um, so action and inaction both carry with them risks. Do you think that? No, no, no sorry, no, no follow-ups. Uh, anyone else would like to respond to that? Okay, next question. In addition to Mrs. Schlafly's uh, categories of the sex you do or the sex you are, um, in light of the development of the case law in Lawrence and and any number of other cases that have affirmed the right uh, with no particular textual uh, basis uh, to define the universe for oneself. Uh, is there any discussion in the literature that there is that the ERA could be interpreted uh, to provide a third definitional possibility, the sex you do, the sex you are, or the sex that you think you are? And that is not a facetious question, because 
for the first time, if it were adopted, there would be actual text on which to hang a particular right. Yeah, okay, I, right. Think, uh, I think we have your question, okay. Anyone? The, 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 the vast majority of the literature on, on the ERA relates to women, relates to, to women and men, uh, because as um, you know, we said at the outset, that was really the purpose of the ERA. So while you, because of the ambiguity of language, you can spin out other you know, f possibilities, um, the fact is that there's no indication that that, that, that that the purpose of the ERA by the drafters, by the folks that have considered it, by the courts that have considered it, and so on, um, intended to go that far at all. So no, I don't know of any any literature on that on that issue because that simply hasn't been the focus. Oh, well, the answer to your question is is no. It's not that's not discussed in the ERA literature. However, it's not an irrelevant question because the Illinois legislature spent a couple of days this year uh, debating the problem of uh, restrooms for transgenders and people who think they're something that they're not. And they spent a couple of days debating that. I don't, I don't think they passed anything, but they felt that was a very serious issue. All right, next question. I just wanted to invite uh, Professor Davis to sort of pitch and uh, say what she would say to convince somebody like me who just follows the ERA sort of on a superficial level, but uh, in looking at it, reasons that, uh, one, the non-objectionable consequences, to the extent uh, there are any, could be passed democratically under existing law, uh, two, the sort of symbolic and uh, international prestige argument uh, seems to the extent honestly held uh, rather reckless to open that kind of can of worms and throw those worms uh, into the compost pile of the federal judiciary. And <laughs> because of those two things, uh, the most natural explanation in trying to analyze the behavior of ERA ad advocates, I think, is that they're trying to bring things in under very general language that people who support that general language would object to in the specific. Why shouldn't we assume that that's really what this is about? Well, I mean, I guess your your question is really: Do ERA advocates have a different social agenda than maybe you do? And um, uh, I think that's entirely possible. But I also don't think that the ERA is 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 tied to that directly. The ERA is really about, at a very basic level, about women's citizenship. And we've talked a little bit about women in combat. And uh, my own personal view is that um, women uh, suffer as citizens because we're not called upon to. Um, serve the country in the same way that, that men are, and that it affects our status within the country generally, it, it, with, as citizens generally. Um, the ERA, remember, what we're talking about here is not something that has already been enacted. We're talking about a democratic process. So what we're debating here is what should the contents of that uh, 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 provision be through the democratic process. So, mm -hmm. so I'm a little confused about what about your suggestion that we could somehow obtain these things otherwise through a democratic process. This is a democratic process through which we're discussing these things. And what we're talking about is so. Um, uh, 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 Uni the issues are so universal and so comprehensive that a constitutional amendment is the appropriate way to address that because what it does is address women's citizenship and put women on a par with other with men uh, in in the nation. Um, the international point that I made is really a policy point. I'm not saying anything about federal judges citing you know international law, the topic of the prior panel. What I'm saying is that the fact that the U.S. doesn't, in its constitution, specifically protect the equality of women and men, undermines our effectiveness internationally and um, in, in certain contexts. Um, and that uh, as, a, as a policy matter, as we consider this as a democratic matter, we, might, we may want to consider that issue because it has an impact on the effectiveness of other, of other initiatives that we're pursuing. Um, so it's another piece to be considered in the debate, but I'm not in any way suggesting that it um, has a, a legal uh, relevance. Well, we're back to the matter that the ERA advocates are not able to show any benefit to women whatsoever. And to say that it's a benefit to women that uh, girls should be called upon to uh, serve in the military just like men, that is an unsaleable proposition. And, uh, but I do think it is important to remind you that the ERA uh, drive was also an attempt for this, the social agenda. 
and the maliciousness against the full-time homemaker is obvious in Ruth Bader Ginsburg's book where she said, and I quote, the concept of husband breadwinner dependent wife who looks after a household and children must be eliminated from the law. And most of you may know that your, your mothers or grandmothers get Social Security set checks based on their dependent status as a full-time homemaker. And they were determined to get rid of it, and that is the way they define equality of rights. There's just no limit to what they can do. If they can say affirmative action is in the definition, getting rid of the benefits uh, to the full-time homemaker is also part of their equality principle. Um, I just wanted to, you know, one quick comment here, and that is it seems to me there are two sets of issues. Uh, one is the affirmative action set of issues. Um, and in a sense, those are not really controversial in, in that, the, um, you know, poll after poll after poll over the, you know, the last 25 years make it clear uh, that the American people are not big on gender preferences or race preferences. Um, and it strikes me as a, 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 a good thing to handle that through uh, constitutional amendments. And here I'm talking about state constitutional amendments, but I see no reason there shouldn't be a similar one uh, for the United States Constitution. The other area um, includes the very, very controversial issues like same-sex marriage, uh, like women in combat. Um, and I think those are good examples of issues that should not be resolved by constitutional amendment. Um, the status quo should not be changed by constitutional amendment. Um, you know, if we decide that, that, that ERA should be passed and women therefore are drafted, uh, women are therefore uh, made subject to combat rules and it doesn't work out, it'll be hard to go back and fix it. Next question. Um, the question is for uh, Professor Davis. <coughs> Um, you said in your prepared remarks um, about strict, um, strict scrutiny versus intermediate scrutiny and how intermediate scrutiny is kind of vague or unclear. You seem to imply that. Um, I guess I'll say something that's probably obvious but I guess relevant, that um, race and sex are very different classifications. Um, race is a um, social construct, whereas sex is a biological fact. I mean, women have babies, men can't. Um, in our society, I think we're at least striving to um, that blacks and whites should be interchangeable. Men and women cannot really be interchangeable. That is to say, um, you can have you know, soldiers, you can have a black soldier, a white soldier, or white secretary of state, black secretary of state, it's not a big deal. Whereas when we send our daughters off to college, we kind of expect that they're gonna have a female roommate, similarly for men. Um, I guess the question is, isn't Intermediate scrutiny, <coughs> same as um, strict scrutiny, except in the, except with exceptions like uh, the ones you cited earlier, like um, bathrooms and uh, bona fide uh, qualifications, et cetera. Um, well, it, I mean, literally, it's not, of course, because the language of strict scrutiny is different than the language of intermediate scrutiny. So. Um, you know, we're talk still talking in those areas where we don't have exceptions for privacy uh, about uh, 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 necessary uh, measures for a, com uh, a compelling governmental interest as opposed to the, the more watered down set of intermediate scrutiny. So, so I'd say no, you know, it's not the same. It's clearly different. And one of the areas where I think, I mean, I mentioned a couple of areas where I think it would make a difference. One was, as I said, the case um, that I argued, the Nguyen versus INS case, where I believe that the U.S. Supreme Court had it been applying a strict scrutiny standard, would have come out differently. Um, instead, the court allowed um, the physical differences between men and women to dictate the outcome of that case when it wasn't really necessary. The case wasn't really about physical differences. It was about different rights between uh, mothers and fathers. And um, I think that the failure to um, sort of uh, apply a strict scrutiny standard means that those physical differences then can overcome um, the uh, equality that we're trying to achieve. I've mentioned the Gadaldi case a few times. Nobody's yet taken me up on my offer to talk about it. Um, but that case, of course, um, the U.S. Supreme Court said that um, s um, 
that, that discrimination on the basis of pregnancy is discrimination, uh, is not sex discrimination, but discrimination against pregnant people. And the impact of that is that discrimination against pregnancy is still permitted constitutionally, even though the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of, of Title VII uh, um, rejected that for purposes of employment. And uh, one of the areas that the ERA would affect, um, the federal ERA would affect, as it has in the states, is to say that when you're discriminated on the basis of unique physical characteristics um, of men or women, that that constitutes sex discrimination, that you can't uh, hide behind some neutral language to say that it's not sex discrimination, have policies that, um, that affect people uh, negatively um, when, uh, when what you're really doing is, is discrimination, discriminating on the basis of sex. Okay. All right, next, uh, next question. Uh, my question is for uh, Professors Harriet and, and Davis. And the, the question is, is that, um, do they believe that the courage and tenacity that has been, I think, so uh, firmly and graciously displayed by Mrs. Shafley in the opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment is equal to or even exceeds that of, of a uh, male soldier on America's battlefields? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that wasn't the question. <laughs> this, is, this is a question for Mrs. Shafley. Uh, you've spoken a great deal about how the ERA really hasn't done or would not do anything for the homemaker. So my question to you is, do you think our current laws, Title VII, you mentioned Equal Pay, Equal pay Act, uh, does the work that the ERA allegedly was supposed to do? And do you think that our current federal and state laws protect women's rights, say, not just the homemaker, but also the young associate at a law firm? Uh, I think our current laws are in pretty good shape, and I think they give us uh, uh, all the protections that uh, women need. If you have a problem, uh, we can introduce a new law. If you have people who violate the laws, and there are people who do that, we have the uh, whole enforcement mechanism. And uh, I, I uh, do not look upon women as victims. I think we're very fortunate to be the American women. I think they're the most fortunate class of people who ever lived. And I think we can deal with any of these problems by specific legislation. We have the Equal Pay Act. We have the Equal Employment Opportunity Act. We have the Equal Education Act. We have the Equal Credit Act. And um, uh, I, I think women are doing just fine in this country. All right. Uh, last... Uh, one last question. Uh, just to take up uh, Professor Davis's um, point, could, could one or both of the other panelists ad address the Gadoldig issue? Uh, I don't know what the what the what, what, the, issue, you, uh, what just is the question. Define the question. Define the question. Yeah, specify what what the question is. If you well, would. I, actually, Professor Davis can probably do it better than I do, could. But as I understand it, Gadoldig versus Aiello was a Supreme Court decision. Um, in, in th that um, in, in the pregnancy context, which um, I guess fail failed to um, or, or de declined to recognize um, discrimination against that that condition as unconstitutional. And I hope Professor Professor Davis will correct me if I got it wrong. I I, I just wondered if anyone had any comment on that. No, I don't have any comment. I've never read the case, so I don't really feel comfortable saying much about it. Yeah. All right. Th th thanks uh, to all of you for your attention and your courtesy and your good questions. And thanks to our panelists.